Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you indoors on this lovely sunny day um, for what is going to be a very interesting, a very provocative, and a very informative uh, session uh, with Ambassador William Rue. Uh, I want to just, uh, before introducing Ambassador Rue, uh, just to mention uh, a couple of things. Um, this program uh, today uh, of course, is, is sponsored by the Dickey Center, and it's part of our Great Issues uh, series of programs. But um, within the Dickey Center, uh, one of our foremost programs is our War and Peace Studies program, uh, which is directed by Professor Daryl Press. And Daryl, there's Daryl. I knew you were here before. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. And um, I, I would just wanted to inform you that the War and Peace program this year uh, is going to have a year-long program. Each year, uh, we pick a theme, you know, to sort of uh, guide the activities of the program for the year. And this year, the subject is the United States in the Middle East. And there are four topics that are going to be covered, you know, in particular during the course of the year. Uh, the first I would mention is the United States-Israeli relationship. And there will be a public lecture on October 26th uh, on that important subject. The other three subjects that will be covered uh, are energy, terrorism, and the very important uh, U.S.-Turkish relationship. So make note of that program and also, as I say, keep in mind uh, October 26th, a presentation on, on the U.S.-Israeli relationship. In addition, uh, I hope all of you are aware by now, there is something called the Dartmouth Center's Forum, uh, which a number of us uh, center directors got together about three or four years ago uh, to establish. Uh, we are now 12 in number. Uh, they are 12 different centers at Dartmouth, uh, the Dickey Center, the Rockefeller Center, uh, the Ethics Institute, the uh, a humanity center, a whole variety of centers on campus. And each year, uh, each of us, of course, does our own program independently, but we also uh, get together and choose a common theme and do programming uh, during the course of the academic year built around that particular theme. And our theme this year is speak out and listen up. And basically what we're doing is addressing uh, the power of communication. And what we're really trying to do is to help promote critical reflection uh, on what it means to find one's voice and to use it uh, to good effect. I think all of us are aware communications uh, today, uh, if you can get underneath the shouting and the television talking heads and everything else, uh, it's a little hard to communicate these days, and we're really trying to focus on this question of how to speak out, but also uh, how to listen up. And today's program uh, is being presented, you know, in support of that Dartmouth Center's forum uh, program. And our theme today, uh, U.S. public diplomacy uh, in the Middle East, really is it fits in perfectly with this question of speak out and listen up. Uh, because individuals speak out and listen up, but uh, countries uh, also uh, do the same thing or should be doing the same thing. And in many ways, that epitomizes uh, the role of public diplomacy. Uh, and our speaker will very, very shortly explain, you know, what I mean by that. But it means basically as a country uh, that the need for us to speak out, explain our policies, our values, why it is we're doing certain things, uh, but also to listen, uh, a very, very important uh, aspect of that. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome today uh, Ambassador William Rue. Uh, Bill is a Foreign Service colleague, a uh, former ambassador, as I've said, and so it's a pleasure to have him here. And his wife, Andrea, there's Andrea sitting in the back. Dr. Andrea Rue spoke yesterday brilliantly for the anthropology department, and we're delighted that, that she is here as well. But Bill is the um, 
uh, Edward R. Murrow, visiting professor of public diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. He was a United States Foreign Service officer uh, from 1964 to 1995 and uh, worked primarily uh, for and with the United States Information Agency in Cairo, Riyadh, and Jeddah, and in Washington as Assistant Director of USIA for the Near East and South Asia. He served with distinction twice as a U.S. Ambassador to Yemen and the United Arab Emirates, and also served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Uh, Embassy in, in Syria. Uh, he was President and CEO of the Educational Non-Governmental Organization, AMID East, uh, from 1995 to 2003, and that's a program that manages educational programs in the Arab world. He's also a scholar, an academic. He holds a PhD in international relations from Columbia University and an MA from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He taught U.S. Uh, Middle East policy and public diplomacy at Fletcher from 1984 to 86, and he has taught uh, public diplomacy there uh, since 2008. He's the author of several books and articles on American diplomacy, Arab media, and U.S.-Arab relations. And he's a member of many boards, including uh, the American University in Cairo, uh, the Middle East Policy Council, uh, the Public Diplomacy Council, Suffolk University International Advisory Board, and the Arab Media and Society Editorial Board. A very distinguished career. So let's everyone please give a warm welcome to Ambassador Bill Rood. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here. This is uh, our first visit to Dartmouth, and I'm very impressed with uh, everything you're doing and all of the variety of, of activities that go on in this town and on this campus. Communication is, is as Ambassador Yellowitz says, a, an appropriate uh, context for me to talk to you because I'm going to talk about public diplomacy, which is a type of communication. When I mention to my friends and, and, and others that I teach public diplomacy, they say, what's that? And usually I have to start uh, with the definition. You all know what diplomacy is, and I'm going to refer to that as traditional diplomacy. Diplomacy is communication between governments. That is to say, U.S. diplomacy is communication between the United States government and foreign governments. It's official engagement uh, between governments. It's usually carried out in secret, and it's carried out by American officials. Public diplomacy, in contrast, is a function carried out by U.S. officials that focuses on foreign publics. And it's in the open. It's not in secret. So uh, I, I will give you some examples and explain uh, how public diplomacy works. But the basic definition is that public diplomacy is a type of diplomacy in which you communicate uh, with foreign publics. Now. Uh, the term public diplomacy only goes back to 1965, but the practice of public diplomacy in the United States goes back much earlier. You can e even de um, date it to the Declaration of Independence if you want to uh, focus on the, the uh, purpose and function of public diplomacy. In the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, which you probably have all uh, memorized, uh, says, let facts be presented uh, be submitted to a candid world. Now that basically uh, in the preamble is the idea that when we uh, decided to break the bonds between uh, the new American nation and Britain, uh, we decided that we had to explain ourselves. We had to explain the reasons uh, for declaring independence and Thomas Jefferson wrote those words uh, to justify the explanation, and, and then he made a long list of, of grievances. Public diplomacy isn't only grievances, as I'll explain in a moment. 
Um, public diplomacy is not well understood. It was a function, it was sort of the uh, stepchild of, of diplomacy for many years because it was practiced mostly abroad and people didn't pay much attention to it until 9-11 when suddenly um, it became a matter of discussion in the American press, in the American Congress. People were, were saying, uh, well, we were attacked on 9-11 because we didn't pay enough attention to foreign public opinion. And now we need to do public diplomacy better because that will fix the uh, problem that led to 9-11. Well, it's not so simple. And I have to say at the outset that public diplomacy doesn't, isn't a cure-all. It's not a panacea. It doesn't fix problems in uh, international relations and in bilateral relations or multilateral relations. Diplomacy doesn't either. Neither diplomacy nor public diplomacy trump uh, policy. And if they don't like our policy, there's no amount of, of public diplomacy or diplomacy that's going to totally fix it. But, but diplomacy and public diplomacy are useful in serving the national interest to help mitigate problems and mitigate uh, misunderstandings. Now, what, how do we do public diplomacy? What are the instruments of public diplomacy? And, and most people don't realize that there's a whole, there's a whole array of instruments uh, for the practitioners of public diplomacy. I was a practitioner for many years, and we drew on, depending on circumstances, we drew on different, different instruments. I'm sure you've heard of the Voice of America. That's an instrument of public diplomacy because it communicates uh, the U.S. government's policy and uh, information about America to foreign audiences. I'm sure you've heard about the Fulbright exchange program. Maybe some of you are Fulbrighters. The Fulbright program is a public diplomacy program because it helps people learn about America by bringing them here, professionals and students, and it, and it sends Americans abroad. Uh, and uh, they not only learn about foreign cultures, but they help represent America when they are, when they are abroad. Exchange programs, by the way, and I have to, I have to focus on that particular instrument uh, for a moment. Exchange programs are usually regarded by public diplomacy professionals as the most powerful and most effective means of carrying, con uh, conducting public diplomacy. The, the best way to help foreign audiences understand America is to bring them here. Now, you can't bring everybody here. Uh, but a foreign student in the United States will understand America better than somebody who never comes to America, never uh, has the opportunity to come to Dartmouth or come uh, to the United States as a student or as a professional. And Fulbright program does professional exchanges as well. So we really believe in uh, the exchange program as, as a powerful instrument in public diplomacy in helping us uh, and the world uh, get better, uh, better understand each other. I have to mention in this context, particularly since uh, Professor Eichelman is, is with us, uh, who is on the board of the American University in, in Kuwait. The American University in Kuwait uh, represents uh, the best of American education in the Middle East. There are other American universities uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the American University in Cairo, where I'm on the board, the American uh, University in Beirut, and, and others. These institutions are not government institutions, but they get the support of the government. And as a diplomat, I, I was always very grateful that the American in, uh, University in Kuwait and AUB and AUC and the other American universities abroad existed because they provided the best American education uh, as, a, as a real example, as a living example. So if, you, if you're a Kuwaiti and you can't afford to come to Dartmouth, you go to the AUK and you get an American education. If you're an Egyptian and you can't afford to come to Dartmouth, you go to the American University in Cairo and you get an American education. As I say, that's not a direct uh, government program, but it's very supportive of, of American public diplomacy uh, purposes. So the Voice of America Broadcasting and the Fulbright and other exchange programs are instruments of uh, American public diplomacy. What are the other instruments? Well, there's an instrument you might call rhetoric, that is public speaking. You all remember that uh, in June of 2004, uh, President Obama made a speech in Cairo uh, talking, addressing primarily the Muslim world and talking about American-Muslim relations. That is public diplomacy. Um, 
at the sa on the same visit, he went and talked to uh, President uh, Hosni Mubarak, the president of Egypt, and he had a private conversation and conducted traditional diplomacy. But his speech at the, uh, America, at the university in Cairo to the public and to the world, because it was broadcast around the world, was public diplomacy, because he wanted to reach over the heads of uh, governments and talk directly to the, America, uh, to the, to the foreign publics. He also conducted um, uh, various uh, smaller meetings. He did town halls in various foreign countries. So the President of the United States is actually doing uh, public diplomacy, uh, much more than his predecessor. I, I don't remember uh, President Bush doing many town halls or making major speeches abroad. So President Obama is, is doing a little bit more than his predecessor in supporting the public diplomacy effort. And that's what you might call rhetoric. It's public speaking. There's another kind of oral communication that is used in public diplomacy, and that I would call a dialogue. Uh, in, in, a, in a town hall meeting, uh, if President Obama takes questions uh, from the audience and answers the questions and comments and complaints and criticisms, that's a dialogue. And dialogue is extremely important in public diplomacy. The best communication we feel as practitioners of public diplomacy is if you listen carefully uh, and then respond to the criticisms and complaints and, and uh, uh, problems that, that people express. Uh, let me digress here for a moment and say the three components of public diplomacy are policy advocacy, uh, listening, and uh, presentation of America generally, that is American culture, American history, American uh, economic situation, American education, the whole spectrum of America. So a public diplomacy uh, uh, practitioner uh, is not just a flack for the policy of the President of the United States. It is the responsibility of an American official, a diplomat or a public diplomacy official, to explain and defend the policy. That's part of it. But beyond that, the American official who does public diplomacy has to uh, take into account the fact that foreign audiences often don't understand America, don't understand our culture, our history, our politics. So it helps to explain our policy if you explain the, po uh, uh, the uh, foreign policy, if you explain the politics behind it. If you uh, want to explain uh, the reasons for our policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict or, or to our uh, intervention in Iraq or our policy in Afghanistan, it helps to explain the background of that policy because it, it, is, it, it is supported or not by the U.S. Congress and the American people and the American press. Now, I say supported or not. Suppose you are in a discussion uh, with, as a public diplomacy official at an American embassy, suppose you're in a discussion with an editor of a newspaper or a foreign student or a foreign uh, uh, academic, a professor, and you're talking about our policy, say, in Iraq, and you explain the reasons why we went into Iraq, how, how the U.S. government sees our policy in Iraq, and the foreign editor says, wait a minute, uh, I don't agree with your policy. What do you think? What's your personal opinion about that policy? And you think to yourself, you hesitate a moment because what is your job? Is your job to uh, defend and, and explain the policy or is it your job to be honest and truthful? There's a, basic, there's a basic principle in public diplomacy that says you must be truthful, never lie, because a, a truthfulness and can, a being candid is always going to lead you to credibility. If you start lying, if you start shading the truth, they will inevitably know that you're, that you're doing that. So if you have the dilemma, it doesn't come up that often, but it comes up occasionally that your interlocutor, as we like to say, says, do you really believe uh, the policy? Do you think the policy is correct? In that case, and, it, and as I say, it's a rare case. In that case, I would say to uh, the person who asked me that question, you're asking me my personal opinion. I'm a representative of the United States government, and I'm explaining the policy as the president understands it, as the Congress under understands it, as the Secretary of State understands it, and as the American public understands it. 
And there's some criticism of that policy in the American uh, public. I can tell you that. And let me explain what the criticism is all about. But I don't need to tell you what my personal opinion is. That's unimportant. That's irrelevant. Now, if he persists and says, well, I really want to know what your personal opinion is and presses me to the wall, I will uh, repeat the same thing again. I'll say, I'm not going to go into my personal opinion. That's not important. He will then, by that time, know <laughs> that I don't totally support the policy. But, but I have convinced him, uh, hopefully, that there is reason for the policy and reasons behind the policy, because I've told him about congressional support, public support. I've to told him about the American public debate about it. So I've helped educate him about America, and I've helped explain the policy as it's understood in the White House and the State Department, but I haven't told a lie. Uh, so these are some often rare occasions. But I want to explain, uh, stress the fact that it is our uh, obligation in public diplomacy to advocate the policy uh, to the extent that you can honestly do it and to also explain America and to also listen carefully. So in that conversation, I learn his complaints and his criticisms of our policy. And I take the, that into account when I'm, when I'm trying to discuss policy with other people in that country. And I report to Washington and to the President of the United States, there are these criticisms of our policy and you need to take them into account, Mr. President and Mr. Madam Secretary. And so it's my job to explain foreign opinion uh, to the policy makers in Washington. So that's, those are, are some of the functions of, of uh, the engagement that you have with foreign audiences. What are some of the other uh, uh, means of communication? We use print media, we issue magazines, we issue, uh, we translate American books, we have American libraries and cultural centers around the world. Some of you may have, have seen them in your travels. Uh, we teach English, we do educational counseling. English is, uh, carries a lot of uh, cultural freight, as you know. We do cultural presentations. We send American uh, musicians and drama groups and, and dancers abroad to represent the best of American culture. What about the modern communication uh, means? Uh, the State Department has a website. Every embassy has a website. Uh, public diplomacy officers at embassies around the world use Twitter and Facebook and SMS and all of those uh, means of communication. And they engage uh, with foreign publics to the extent they can through the modern means of, of communication. That's, of course, developed in the, last, in the last decade. Now, why do we do public diplomacy in the first place? I mentioned the Declaration uh, of Independence. The ultimate reason uh, that we do public diplomacy at all uh, in the world is that every foreign government is susceptible to and influenced by uh, its own public opinion. Even the most, uh, the toughest, the most authoritarian uh, uh, dictatorship, Saddam Hussein, for example, has to worry about his own public opinion. So if we can reach the public opinion in Iraq under Saddam and help uh, educate them and give them a different view from the one that Saddam is giving them because he he's giving them a different he was giving them a different view uh, from the one we were uh, trying to express uh, then that helps us Saddam Hussein jammed the voice of America because he didn't want to have American views uh, expressed to his his public and he controlled his own media so it's important for us to uh, communicate uh, to uh, foreign audiences, foreign public opinion, because they in turn influence the policies and views of their own governments. It's also important because there are a lot of distortions out there. If any of you who read the foreign press, any of you who, who are aware of what is being said around the world about the United States know that there's a lot of misinformation. Some of it is out of ignorance, some of it is deliberate distortion. So we deal with misinformation, we try to, to correct the record. We, we try, we're, we're actually, uh, however, quite modest in our expectations that we can change everybody's mind. Um, you uh, expect that you are competing in a world of um, com mass communications in which people have 
huge amounts of information about the United States and its policies and its society and so on. Uh, and you are competing uh, in a world in which not everybody is going to believe you. They're not going to believe the U.S. government. So you look for people uh, who are open-minded, who are willing to talk to you, and you try to convince them uh, of your uh, policies and uh, the uh, facts about American society. Let me give you an, a recent example. You remember, uh, you will remember that a, f a few weeks ago, um, a, uh, a preacher named Terry Jones in Gaithersburg, Florida, announced that uh, he was going to have burned the Koran day. Um, this story started uh, some time ago, but it got the attention of the foreign press uh, just before 9-11. He was going to do it on the anniversary of 9-11. And there was a great deal of consternation in the Muslim world uh, that an American was going to uh, burn the Koran. Um, that uh, level of uh, distress and consternation and criticism rose to the extent that it became a public diplomacy problem. It became a problem with foreign Muslim governments, but it also became a problem on the, on the public level uh, because people were demonstrating, people were rioting, uh, and in the process, uh, violence was uh, breaking out uh, because of the report of one small preacher in Florida who announced that he was going to burn the Quran. Uh, Muslims, most Muslims are very sensitive about that, uh, and they were demonstrating and complaining. The result of these complaints uh, and demonstrations around the world in Muslim countries led the President of the United States to speak out and condemn uh, Reverend uh, Jones uh, for his planned uh, burning of the Koran. It led the Secretary of Defense to call uh, Reverend Jones and ask him not to do it. It led uh, General Petraeus to warn that th this would be a terrible thing to happen because it would endanger American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. These were all public diplomacy responses to an incident in the United States that had been carried and, and reported around the world. There were riots. There were people who were hurt and, and even killed because of the report of this man in, in Florida. I heard a report uh, on NPR that, uh, that, in, um, at, that in India there were riots that led to deaths, and the people who rioted because of this uh, incident had heard the news on uh, Iranian uh, radio after the fact, after 9-11, they reported that the, um, the man had actually gone ahead and burned Korans. Now, he hadn't done that. He decided not to do it. He was convinced by the President and the Secretary of Defense not to do it. But the Iranian uh, radio station uh, decided to say that, uh, and it was not true, decided to say that this man had already done it. Why, it, why did they do it? Because the Iranians and the Americans are in confrontation mode. And the Iranian uh, regime decided that this would hurt the United States around the world if they broadcast this false news. So public diplomacy practitioners are dealing with hostile media in many cases. And they are having to take action uh, to speak out and explain uh, that this didn't happen, but also to try to explain the background. How do you, how do you deal with a story like that? I mean, you. He, the man wasn't arrested. He wasn't physically prevented from burning a Koran. So you had to re resort to diplomacy and public diplomacy to help deal with the problem. That's just one example and one incident, and there have been many more. May, many of you may remember uh, the uh, Danish cartoon controversy back in 2005 when a Danish newspaper published cartoons of the, of the Prophet Muhammad, and there were riots and demonstrations, and people were killed around the world because this was considered blasphemous and, and an insult to Islam. So uh, the modern communication means transmit stories, true or false, uh, that get people excited. And in today's world, uh, public diplomacy practitioners have to deal with the rapid transmission of communications around the world. And when I was working in public diplomacy uh, in the past, we didn't have to deal with the rapid uh, nature of, uh, of uh, communications. 
Public diplomacy practitioners focus on local conditions. Um, the uh, policy is made in Washington. The ambassadors around the world carry out that policy, but they do so and explain the policy in the local context. Every country is different, and if you talk to an ambassador or a public diplomacy professional who has worked abroad at an embassy, they will tell you that their first task is to figure out the local environment and what people care about locally. If you go to the Middle East, uh, many of the uh, uh, countries in the, in the Arab world, uh, the major issue, the overwhelming issue when they look at America is the Arab-Israeli conflict. But there are other issues. In Iraq, it's really Iraqi democracy, which is a bigger issue. Uh, if you go to Turkey, uh, you find and ask what is the big issue with American, uh, with uh, the, the view of America and, and local uh, public opinion, they'll say, well, Iraq is important, but what about Armenia? They're concerned about the Armenian genocide issue. Now, most Americans don't even know what the Armenian genocide issue is, but the Turks certainly do know, and they are watching and waiting to see if Obama will criticize Turkey for the Armenian genocide. He hasn't done that. But the uh, American ambassador in Turkey and the public diplomacy officers know that if he did, that would be a big public diplomacy problem because the, the public looks through the genocide issue uh, through that lens at America. If you go to Japan, the issue, one of the big issues is American bases in o Okinawa and on and on. You can go to every country in the world and find a local issue that trumps the, the major issues that we care about in Washington. So the public diplomacy professional and the American diplomat generally has to worry about uh, local conditions. Public diplomacy is, do, is done today by the Department of State. In the past, for half a century, between 1953 and, and 1999, it was done by the U.S. Information Agency. I worked for USIA. Uh, during those years, but now it's done by the State Department. But today there is also a great deal of, of communication to foreign audiences, which is public diplomacy, by the Department of Defense. Uh, they call it strategic communications. Uh, they do it in, in somewhat different ways and for different purposes. They do it to support uh, the military operations that they're carrying out. But there's a great deal more uh, activity in, in this field uh, by the Department of Defense today. Now let me uh, very briefly uh, tell you uh, about a couple of cases to be more specific to help uh, uh, make this uh, more tangible for you. And I, I'm picking Middle East cases uh, because they're the ones that I'm most for w familiar with. Let's take, for example, public diplomacy in Egypt. The American-Egyptian official diplomatic relation is, uh, relationship is very friendly. We have, a, we have a friendly relationship. Most of the media in, in Egypt is very friendly and helpful to us. So the public affairs officer, the public diplomacy person at the American Embassy in Cairo can go to the editor of the major newspapers and give them some information, the full text of Obama's latest speech, and they might publish it. Uh, they might have a report of the speech that is only partial or filtered or, or not, not complete. Uh, and they're happy to have the, the full text, and they may publish it. So you are, you are doing a service to the newspaper, but the newspaper editor is friendly, and he's willing to publish your, your uh, text. Uh, if you go to a, a small newspaper in Egypt, which is less friendly, they may not publish the text. But you do, do you have a function in Egypt of what we call press placement. That means uh, bringing information and data uh, to the editor of the newspaper. Now, you may... Um, alert him to the fact that you have a new text by SMS uh, or telephone or uh, put it on your website. So we use modern means of communication, but press placement is a, is a major uh, activity uh, in public uh, diplomacy. And every embassy receives every day uh, a major, what we call the Washington file, um, of uh, texts and information from the American press, uh, and backgrounders and editorials that help explain what's going on uh, in the United States. Of course, they have their own sources, but they may not be uh, complete. The American uh, embassy in uh, Egypt used to have a cultural center. 
uh, which was a standalone independent library and center. Now they have an, what they call an information resource center inside the embassy. It's less accessible because of security reasons, and that's a problem for public diplomacy because people are less likely to come to it. But it provides American books, and it, and it provides free Internet access. We have uh, cultural programming in Egypt. We bring uh, American uh, musicians and other uh, uh, performers uh, to Egypt on a regular basis. We have a Fulbright program in Egypt. We have other educational and, and professional exchanges between Egypt and the United States, and they're ongoing. All of those are valuable public diplomacy uh, tools. Most important to the public diplomacy professional is personal contact because uh, all of these other activities depend on uh, a, a, a public diplomacy personnel, and that includes local hires, the Egyptians who work in the public diplomacy section. Uh, it depends on their understanding of the local environment and advising on who to talk to, introducing to you to the newspaper editors, um, advising you on programs, which uh, cultural events uh, to bring to Cairo, um, which musical events, whether ballet is appropriate or uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a jazz band or uh, a, a symphony orchestra, uh, and you decide basis, based on your knowledge of the country and on your recommendations from your Foreign Service nationals, your local employees, uh, what programs to carry out. And all of these programs are possible in Egypt because it's a friendly country. And you teach English. Uh, in Egypt, and that's a door opener. It helps people prepare to study in America, and it also carries uh, cultural content. Let me give you a contrasting example. We have a public diplomacy program in Syria uh, that has major difficulties. Unlike, unlike Egypt, Syria is a country where we have a confrontational arrangement uh, uh, relationship. We have um, a uh, situation where the Syrians and the United States disagree on seven or eight major to policy topics. We have policy disagreements between the two governments, and this, of course, affects uh, the public diplomacy program, and it affects, uh, in, a, in a negative way, all of our diplomacy in Syria. Let me just list for you, and you're probably familiar with the, all of these issues, let me list the, the issues that uh, the U.S. government has identified as problem issues between the two countries. The Arab-Israeli conflict, we disagree on that. Um, the uh, the uh, Israelis have occupied the Golan Heights. The Syrians uh, claim that as their sovereign territory. Uh, they want it back. Uh, we have uh, different ways of, of looking at that uh, particular problem and how to solve it. Uh, the United States, as you know, has embarked on a new uh, effort recently to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, but focusing on the Palestinian aspect and not on the Syrian aspect. Um, my hope is that we will focus also on the Syrian uh, front as well. But the Arab-Israeli conflict is maybe at the top of the list, and when American and Syrian officials get together, they argue about that issue more than anything. Secondly, Iran. The United States is in confrontation with Iran. The Syrian government for strategic reasons, has a close uh, strategic alliance with Iran and helps the Iranian government in Lebanon. Lebanon is the third issue on my list. Lebanon is an area of confrontation between uh, the United States and Syria. Uh, we, support the Syria we, we support the Lebanese government. The uh, Syrians have uh, had a pr proprietary interest in, in Syria because they are a close neighbor. And we have a different approach uh, to Syrian uh, politics. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hariri was assassinated, some people think, by a Syrian gunman. Uh, that case is still pending, and it's an issue that we discuss with the Syrians. They deny it. Uh, we're not uh, certain. Terrorism is the fourth issue on my list of, of confrontational uh, problems. Uh, the uh, Syrian government has played host in Damascus to a number of uh, Palestinian organizations that we consider to be terrorist organizations. They're on our terrorist list. We don't talk to them. We are uh, opposed to Palest these Palestinian radical groups, 
uh, the Syrian government uh, plays host to them and con considers them merely uh, liberation organizations that they have a right to support and they are determined to support. Number five, Iraq. Uh, we have had a uh, problem with Syria on Iraq after the uh, American-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, we think the Syrians had at one point supported the insurgency in, in Iraq. The, situ the uh, temperature in that particular issue has, has been reduced slightly, but still there's some problems between the United States and Syria over Iraq. Number six, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we suspect that the Syrians are involved in uh, the acquisition of weapons of mass destruction. They deny it, and so we argue about that. And number seven, human rights. We complain about their human rights violations uh, internally, and they reject that complaint. Now, Syria is uh, a country where we not only have uh, an adversarial relationship in arguments over these issues and some others, and it's a, con a contentious bilateral relationship, but we have a difficult uh, diplomatic relationship because we haven't had an ambassador there for five years. The Bush administration withdrew our ambassador uh, from uh, Ambassador Scobie from uh, uh, Syria uh, five years ago uh, over the Hariri assassination, and we have not returned the American ambassador. Now, it's difficult to have a satisfactory discussion and reasonable and quiet discussion uh, with the Syrian government if you don't have an ambassador there. We have a chargé d'affaires, a, a more junior officer at the American embassy. He's not an accredited ambassador. So the president of Syria won't receive him. He'll receive only an American ambassador. Um, there are people in Washington who think it, it was a good thing that we withdraw, withdrew our ambassador from Syria because we're showing the Syrians that we disagree with their policies. We're punishing them by not having an ambassador there. In fact, as a diplomat, and I don't know if Ambassador Yalowitz would agree, we should have an ambassador there because in order to conduct our policy and in order to, for the Syrians to know what our policy is and, and in order for us to know what the Syrian policy is, clearly and unambiguously, we need to have an ambassador there talking to the president of Syria. We don't have one. Now, President Obama decided uh, to send an ambassador back to, uh, an ambassador to Syria and, and reverse the policy of the Bush administration. It's hard, by the way, parenthetically, it's hard to withdraw an ambassador and then send an ambassador back because you have to explain why you're doing that. The, the initial grievance, if it hasn't been satisfied, if the Syrians haven't confessed to the assassination of Hariri or apologized for one thing or another, you can't send an ambassador back. But if you have a new president, he can say, well, I'm going to change the policy. I'm going to go for engagement rather than confrontation. And his policy, President Obama's policy, has been engagement with Syria, engagement with Iran. So he agreed to send an ambassador to Syria. However, uh, there are seven Republican senators uh, who have blocked the assignment of, the, of Robert Ford, who was designated by uh, President Obama to go to Syria as ambassador. Any one senator can block uh, the uh, assignment of, a, of an ambassador to a foreign country. As you know, the Constitution requires that an ambassador have the uh, advice and consent of the Senate to go out to his or her post. In this case, uh, uh, Mr. Ford was nominated uh, by President Obama. He was approved by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then one senator uh, managed to get six others to join him and block uh, the assignment. And he said, we don't, we don't want to uh, give the uh, Syrian government any support, so we don't want to send an ambassador out there. So there's a confrontation between the Obama administration and seven senators over the fact that uh, whether we should send an ambassador out there. But it, it hampers our, our, our diplomacy. The Syrians, for their part, have also put obstacles in the way of public diplomacy. Uh, the uh, Syrians have not allowed American diplomats to have official contact with any of the military or any of the Ba'ath Party, which uh, leads the country, or any, uh, any uh, Syrians under the age of 18. Uh, they have restricted our contacts at the university. 
they recently closed three American institutions. One was the American Cultural Center, which was a public diplomacy institution. They closed the American Language Center, which supported, uh, which taught English and, and supported American public diplomacy. And they closed the Damascus Community School, which was helpful in educating Syrians uh, on a, a K through 12 uh, level. And they cl closed an American NGO Amid East, which was doing educational counseling uh, in Syria. In addition to that, the Syrian government has uh, created over the years, and this isn't just recent, over the years, a fairly hostile climate uh, to the United States and to American public diplomacy activities uh, through its press and through its constant daily uh, criticism in the Syrian press and public statements by Syrian officials of the United States and this makes Syrians afraid to have contact with Americans. Uh, I mentioned that uh, public, uh, personal contact is terribly important, but if you're a Syrian, you don't really want to be seen having a lot of official contact uh, with American officials. It happens anyway. Um, American officials are uh, creative and able to make contact with Syrians. Uh, they have them to their home. Uh, they meet them in restaurants. They meet them quietly don't make a large uh, uh, affair out of it. Uh, but doing uh, programs in Syria is difficult But because Syrian uh, official government agencies aren't willing to co-sponsor programs. So you have to persuade a Syrian uh, agency, a uh, university or a cultural uh, ministry to, to, to do a program. If it's an American speaker or an American musical performance, that they will do it and we won't even put our name on it. We won't take credit for it. Washington wants the embassy to get credit for it, and we say, no thanks, we, we don't need credit, we just need to get the, get the program done. So um, those are two contrasting, and, and because of a short time, I, I, I want to end with that, but simply say that uh, there are differences between every, uh, between every country and every other country in terms of the environment for c carrying out public diplomacy. Um, in some countries, we can use the modern communication means, uh, the website and so on. In Iran, for example, we are restricted to uh, doing public diplomacy from the outside. Uh, we broadcast into Iran. Uh, we don't have uh, exchange programs. We don't have cultural centers. We don't have people on the ground. We don't have any embassy there. So it's very restricted. In other countries, we have a free hand, as in Egypt, pretty much a free hand. I mentioned one last example of where we have a free hand. A student of mine last semester did a study of public diplomacy in Kenya. She happened to be from Kenya, and she discovered that the American ambassador to Kenya, uh, Ambassador Mike Renneberger, has a regular blog on which he criticizes the Kenyan government for its lack of democracy. Now, that's extraordinary to me as, as a diplomat. If, if you're a, an American diplomat in any foreign country, you usually have to be a bit careful about criticizing the host government. They can declare your, declare your persona non grata. They can throw you out of the country, or they can make life miserable for you. And so in most countries, um, you, you have difficulty in directly criticizing the host government. But Ambassador Renneberger has discovered that he can get away with it. So diplomats and public diplomacy professionals uh, go up to the red line, they push the envelope, they do the best they can to get the word out and to express American views. And he believes, and he's supported by Washington in, the, in this, that the Kenyan government is not democratic enough. And so he speaks out. And in his blog, he criticizes the government for not firing uh, the, the chief of anti, the anti-corruption office, who is corrupt. So uh, he gets away with it uh, because of the environment. In most other countries, he wouldn't get away with it. But this is an example of using modern communication means uh, to do public diplomacy. Uh, but first, he had to figure out if he could get away with it and if he could take the risk of uh, speaking out in this very direct way about a very sensitive local issue. Now, I don't want to take any more time. I'd love to have your comments and questions, so let me stop there. Thank you very, very much, Bill. 
Uh, now we'll take questions, and as our practice at Dickey Center events, uh, students take priority. Uh, when you raise your hand, we have uh, wonderful students with a microphone. Uh, please wait to ask your question until you have the mic in hand because we're recording this, uh, and otherwise we won't have the question recorded. So students first, uh, raise your hands. Who's, who wants to go first? Ariana, you're first. If it's okay, if you use a microphone, is that okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind. Can you, can you hold it for me? Okay. okay. Um, some of what you're describing as public diplomacy seems to border on propaganda. Would you agree with that assessment or would you disagree with that assessment? Uh, the definition of propaganda has been, has been debated and discussed by scholars forever. Um, typically, you describe propaganda in three categories, black, white, and gray. <laughs> and not to be too uh, academic about it, black propaganda is information conveyed to somebody else, in this case a foreign audience, in which you do not, you not only hide the source, but you pretend that you're uh, another source. That's not public diplomacy. Gray propaganda is information where you don't reveal the source. You don't, uh, you're not deceptive about it, but you don't reveal it. It's an anonymous source. That's gray propaganda. That's also not public diplomacy because you have to be truthful about the source. White propaganda is where you admit the source. Now that, in effect, is basically the same as public diplomacy. But the problem with the term propaganda is that it has a pejorative context in America. And so we tend to avoid it. I don't like to use it. Some of my colleagues use propaganda and say, yes, this is white propaganda. I don't like it because it conveys lies, and it conveys deception, and it conveys manipulation. And if you're going to do pu public diplomacy effectively, you don't do any of those things. You have to be truthful and honest and open. Um, in your book, you mentioned in the late 90s that uh, they consolidated the, I guess, the public agency into the State Department. Have you seen since, and you talked about like how the bureaucracy slowed down a lot of things, it was kind of like getting all bunged up and stuff. Have you seen since the Obama administration that things have kind of been reversed and put more emphasis towards this public diplomacy as adverse to just State Department? I think you've asked two questions, if I understood you correctly. The State Department and USIA merged in 1999, and most of us think that was a mistake. Even some of the people who were involved in, in the merger at the time have uh, agreed with us. <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm outside the government now. I can, you know. Um, but my, my colleagues who are still in the government are finding that it didn't achieve the merger of state and USIA didn't achieve what it was uh, uh, supposed to achieve. It was supposed to achieve a, a bringing together of public diplomacy and policy by putting the public diplomacy people inside the State Department. Under USIA, it was a separate agency which followed policy. It was required to follow policy but not be that close to policy. It was more flexible, more creative, um, and it was able to, to work more quickly and more effectively and more efficiently. The merger scattered the public diplomacy professionals around the State Department. There's no cohesion. The uh, senior person in the State Department res responsible for public diplomacy is the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and, and Public Affairs. She has none of the authority of the previous director of the U.S. Information Agency. She has no budgetary authority. She has no personnel authority. She can't control uh, programs at all. She has nothing. I had a chance to meet with the latest one uh, uh, last year, um, and I told her that. I said, you know, I I'm sorry to tell you this, but you don't have any authority, and you ought to try to find some. Um, I'm sorry. What, what was the second part of your question? Well, then how do you, I guess I kind of ask, have you seen, like, any progression? Oh, back yeah. Any improvement? Um, there's been some improvement uh, since uh, the advent of the Obama administration in, this, in the sense that uh, the president seems to understand public diplomacy much better than his predecessor did. He has, as, as uh, I noted, been doing public speeches 
to foreign audiences in Cairo and, and, and elsewhere. His first interview uh, was with an Arab uh, television station, Al Arabiya. Uh, that, was, that showed to me concern about his, um, his uh, public diplomacy uh, uh, process. Um, and the polls show that his coming to power in America uh, have improved America's image around the world. But that has nothing directly to do with public diplomacy. That's simply people are anticipating that they'll like him better. Uh, but already the polls are better, so that helps the public diplomacy professionals. But we have yet to see because people are looking at the policies. And as I say, you know, diplomacy and public diplomacy don't trump policy. And after the Cairo speech, some people are saying, well, you know, what has he done to, to fix the problems? Uh, nice speeches, but what's next? The only comment that I would make um, is that for I was not a USIA officer. I was an economics officer coming up through the State Department ranks. And after the merger, uh, I think it became much clearer to the Foreign Service officers who were not USIA, uh, who were becoming ambassadors, that public diplomacy was a very important part of our work. Uh, so I think that was one positive aspect of bringing it you know, more directly into the State Department. But the negatives, I think, were very well explained. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, please. Yeah, how does uh, American media, such as Hollywood movies and television shows, affect public diplomacy? Uh, very good question. I, I, I should have explained that more. Um, w when I said that um, American public diplomacy works in the context of, of global media and, and has to deal with the facts on the ground, which mean that a lot of people have information that we don't control in the government uh, about America. Uh, Hollywood is a, is a very good example. Hollywood movies are prized around the world, and they may or may not convey an accurate picture of America. Um, we, we can't control that. Uh, we don't control Hollywood. Now, there have in the past been some uh, partnerships between the U.S. government, USIA, and, and Hollywood, uh, and there have been partnerships between the Pentagon uh, and Hollywood. Um, there's some books written about this, if you're interested, which, which reveal um, some of the deals that have been made uh, between Hollywood and, and the Pentagon uh, to portray the U.S. military in a, in a positive light in, in return for access to military equipment and bases and all of that. And, and the USIA also worked with Hollywood. But, but it's a, a, an arm's length relationship. If there is a Hollywood film that, uh, in the past, if there was a Hollywood film uh, that we thought was useful to portray some aspect of America that was accur accurate, we in, at a field post would try to get a copy of that film and have it, have it shown. I remember once in Cairo we had Charlton Heston come and, and accompany one of his films, and he, was, he drew a big crowd because he gave a talk after the film about his uh, work in, in Hollywood. And this was an aspect of American culture uh, that they appreciated and they wanted to meet the man and see him in person and, and see his film. And so Hollywood, we partnered with Hollywood and with a, an actor from Hollywood uh, to present an aspect of American culture. Now, not all Hollywood films are helpful. Um, and Hollywood uh, does its own marketing. So they don't need our help. But when I was in Cairo as public affairs officer, we helped um, Hollywood uh, get, the, get its films into the annual um, film festival in, in Egypt, which is a major, it was then the major film festival in the Middle East. So we were the intermediaries with the Egyptian government to get Hollywood films um, uh, accepted. And in some cases, they had... Uh, they had banned specific actors and actresses because of their support for Israel, so we had to help them overcome that. So we sometimes play a role in helping Hollywood get its films, uh, but most of their films are, are taken without our help. Can I add one little thing to that? Uh, 
one thing I found a lot is you would oftentimes come across young people, uh, you know, in overseas and in the former Soviet Union, uh, who would uh, have picked up some English from watching an American movie and they would start talking to you and you thought that they were fluent in English and you realize only they had was a, a few words that they had picked up from an American <laughs> film right. and they had no idea what they were talking about. Right. They just sort of spouted it back because they loved the films. Let me just ask, Ed, Ken, uh, if, if you go to the Middle East, and I'm, I assume it's true in other parts of the world, but in the Middle East you will find a huge amount of American Hollywood films and television films and television documentaries and television game shows and television shows of all kinds on Arab television. Uh, now they filter it and censor it. It may not be appropriate uh, for their environment, but it's already there. And that's generally speaking, it's usually on balance helpful, not always helpful. I'll give you a, a quick example. Um, in Bahrain, there was a TV company that decided uh, to do an Arab version of Big Brother um, and had a local um, house with men and women, Arab men and women, living together in the house. Now, I, I could have told them that this was risky. <laughs> uh, even in Bahrain, which is relatively progressive and liberal in, in the Arab context, uh, it didn't work. They did it once, and then it was shut down by pro because of protests from the religious authorities that, that this was immoral, and they were, you know, then, then the religious authorities went on to comment that they, they were taking immoral American programs from America and watch out for American pollution of our culture. So, you know, they, but they, if they could, they would take a lot of American stuff. Sometimes they have to worry about their own uh, environment, political environment, cultural environment. Next question. Yeah, please. Um, are public diplomacy officials allowed to endorse candidates in foreign elections? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, Involvement in local politics is, is usually considered off limits. Uh, in Iran, uh, Obama never, he never directly supported the opposition, even though it was right. pretty obvious that the U.S. was supporting the opposition. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think in that particular case, uh, the way President Obama responded to the Iranian election uh, was good public diplomacy and good diplomacy because he avoided the trap of looking as if he was supporting one side so the regime could blame uh, us for the opposition. And we wanted to stay out of it. Now, there are people who are now arguing that in Iran we should much more, we should express our support for the opposition much more and we should complain. Now, there were, there were some mild, muted complaints uh, about the way the election was carried out because the officials, Ahmadinejad and others, claim that it was a, f uh, a fair election, and you know it, it was. It's better in that case, I think. It's it's prudent to stay out of it, and and the general rule is to answer your question that we don't get involved uh, in local politics. Now, as I say, in Kenya, the ambassador is directly involved in sensitive local issues, um, but he can get away with it, and um, and it seems to be working. It just, I had this exact problem in Belarus because uh, we were dealing with an authoritarian government and uh, I did something similar to what uh, uh, Mike did in, in Kenya. Uh, but the way you really handle a situation like that is you stick to American principles and you make it very clear that we support democracy, multi-parties, uh, you know, freedom of the press, and it's very, very obvious, you know, where you're standing. Right. Uh, and without directly getting involved in the local <clears throat> politics, you're just espousing American principles. Right. The safest thing is to talk about America. Yeah. I, I write, uh, write an op-ed from time to time in an Arab newspaper in the Persian Gulf, and I always talk about America. Now, in some cases, my indirect comment is about what's going on in Abu Dhabi, but I never talk really about Abu Dhabi and criticize. I, I'm not an American official anymore, but I think it goes over better 
uh, and, and they'll keep asking me to write op-eds. If, if I talk about America, which is a safe subject, I can criticize America or I can defend America, and I do both. Uh, I try to give them an honest evaluation of what's going on in the United States that might be of importance uh, or interest uh, to them. Yeah, in the back, right, right behind you. Oh, good, okay. Uh, when you first mentioned public diplomacy and kind of communicating directly with the citizens of foreign nations, it really made me think of the outreach efforts that have been made by the military in, say, Afghanistan, where they speak to the tribal leaders, and made me wonder about kind of the overlap in diplomatic communication between the Defense Department and the State Department. Do you ever feel that there's friction generated because there's the messages being communicated bo by both aren't exactly congruent? Do you feel that there's redundancy in the functions that are being carried out by both departments? Thank you for that question. That, that's uh, actually a major issue in a discussion among people who are, who are interested in public diplomacy today. Uh, because of 9-11, because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Pentagon has gotten heavily involved in communicating with foreign governments or foreign publics and doing things that look to me like public diplomacy. Now, they say that they have to do it because nobody else is doing it. And well, the State Department is, is supposed to be doing it, uh, but they don't have much money uh, compared to the Pentagon. The Pentagon is able to throw a lot of money at it, a lot of people at it, and they're doing that. They call it strategic communications or public diplomacy, uh, but in fact, they're doing it. And they're doing it not just in those two war zones, uh, where you know you can easily uh, justify uh, doing uh, an information program to the local public because they're fighting wars. They also have websites directed at North African audiences, uh, and North Africa is not a war zone. Uh, I'll give you one small example of a of a program on the ground in Yemen. Uh, there is an American embassy public diplomacy official who has a, an ongoing public diplomacy normal operation that's been going on for years and years. It was going on when I was there, and it's still going on. Next to her desk in her office is a desk uh, that's occupied by an official from the Pentagon, a uniformed officer who is conducting public diplomacy. Uh, now, it's good that they're sitting in the same office and they coordinate and cooperate, and they have parallel to answer your question. It, it, it's all coordinated, uh, but it's uh, two different agencies of government uh, with two different pots of money, two different sets of personnel uh, doing parallel programs. Now, he is doing, for example, a program to reach out to Yemeni women to help them understand democracy. Now, what does that have to do with war fighting? Well, he says it has to do with war fighting because it's fighting terrorism. Okay, I mean, it's a stretch maybe, but that's their thinking. Now, the, the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, has spoken out a number of times and said, wait a minute, why are we doing all of this uh, communication with foreign audiences? We do war fighting. That's our job. And uh, we shouldn't be doing so much of it. It should be done by the State Department, which is the official agency uh, charged with public diplomacy. But nobody in Congress says, all right, we'll give all your public diplomacy money over to the State Department. Uh, the Pentagon has, um, doesn't have always a difficult time getting money out of Congress. Uh, the State Department has a, uh, more difficulty. Uh, and so the imbalance in resources has led to the Pentagon doing a lot in communication with foreign audiences. Now, maybe when the Iraq uh, and Afghanistan crises are over, this will uh, change and that we'll go back to the State Department doing the bulk of it. Does it cre create tension and conflict? There are some people in the State Department who say, this is mission creep, we ought to be doing this. Why is the Pentagon doing it? There's some people in the Pentagon saying, those guys over in the State Department aren't doing it. It's got to be done, so we've taken up uh, the task. And uh, that argument is, is ongoing, and it hasn't been resolved um, as of 
as we speak. It was a good question. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, the Senate or members of the Senate had blocked the nomination of Robert Ford to ambassadorship. Uh, do you ever see a time when that's appropriate, or is it not generally appropriate? Well, um, is it appropriate to block the uh, confirmation of an American ambassador? <laughs> yes, sometimes it is. I mean, if if the president nominated an incompetent candidate who doesn't know where the country is and doesn't speak the language, I, I hope they would block his appointment. But the reasons that, that these seven senators have given, I think is inappropriate. I, I, I believe in engagement. I think Robert Ford should go. Uh, and I think it would help the US national interest if he were there. We would learn more about Syria. Syria would learn more about us. Uh, the president of Syria has had five years of no ambassador to talk to, and his ambassador in Washington doesn't necessarily give him the same story we would give him uh, through our uh, diplomatic uh, representatives. Um, now, George Mitchell has been to Syria a couple of times and has talked to uh, the president of Syria about the peace process. That's fine, but we need an ambassador on the spot who can go uh, at a moment's notice if he has to, he, he can go any day of the week. He's, he's there uh, on a long-term basis, and he can explain American policy on all of these contentious issues. We need to have him there. So I think it's totally inappropriate uh, to block uh, the assignment of, of an American ambassador in this case for those reasons. Um, so, um, just wanted to know, what would you say would be the future, in, in the future, with American diplomacy and diplomatic policy changing, how important would public policy become vis-a-vis -vis traditional policy? Is it going to become more important, or are they going to work uh, with, with each other? Well, um, public diplomacy and diplomacy have always worked in tandem. Uh, since it started, and, and officially, you know, as a formal matter, as an institutionalized function of the U.S. government, <clears throat> we've had it since the 1930s continually. We had public diplomacy during World War I, during World War II, um, and uh, since the 30s, we've always had a public diplomacy function, first in the State Department, then in USIA, and, and now again in the State Department. <clears throat> so I think it's a permanent function of, of our uh, national interest and our national uh, uh, relationship with foreign countries. Whether it will become a bigger function uh, or a smaller function rel relative to others remains to be seen. It depends on the president, depends on the secretary of state, uh, depends on the Congress, uh, how they see it. <clears throat> Public diplomacy tends to grow in crisis situations. Uh, during World War I and during World War II, public diplomacy became a big story. During the Cold War, it became a big story. The largest number of public diplomacy professionals in the Foreign Service uh, occurred during the Vietnam War, and then it diminished. And, and during the 90s, during the uh, Clinton administration, after the end of the Cold War, the number uh, was reduced. So when crises occur, and now it's growing back again, it's, it's coming up again. So the Congress, uh, likes to put money into public diplomacy and, and authorize positions in that function when there's, a, when there's a crisis. When the Cold War was over, they thought it was less necessary. So it's hard to predict what will happen in the future. It depends on the environment, depends on what the Congress thinks, what the President thinks, what the Secretary of State thinks. I mean, our, our leadership has a big influence over this, and the leadership of the Pentagon as well, because they've been such a big, become such a big player uh, in international communications, that if the Secretary of State uh, and the Secretary of Defense decide to move some of the money and, and uh, positions, people positions, over to the State Department, that'll happen. They could do it, uh, but with, with the consent of Congress, of course. And Congress always uh, uh, is, uh, is, is quick to support uh, military requests and not so quick to support public diplomacy requests. 
Although the exchange program does have uh, resonance on Capitol Hill. Members of Congress like Fulbright and like the exchange program. So when the merger took place between state and, and USIA in 1999, uh, the USIA people were able to wall off, as they say, wall off the exchange budget from the State Department. They were afraid the State Department, the Secretary of State, would steal all the public diplomacy money for other things, so they walled it off. And so half of it can't be touched, half of the public diplomacy money can't be touched, and that goes to exchanges. And the Congress agreed with that because they, they like Fulbright and exchange programs. Even though Syria has been very hostile to our policies, you think we should have an ambassador there. Is there an, ever a time when we should not conduct diplomacy with the country or refuse to place an ambassador in the country? Um, short answer is no. Uh, I think we should also in, always engage. I can't imagine any situation where we gain by not having an ambassador. Um, we don't punish them, we punish ourselves. Uh, they have less information about our policy. They have less understanding of our policy. They're more likely to make mistakes. If a crisis occurs between us, an incident on the border, uh, we need to have the ambassador there ready to go in and immediately deal with it, with the top guy, with the head of state. Uh, he, after all, more than in our country, he, he controls policy. And, you know, if, he, if he's misinformed, um, you know, we have a problem. He has a problem, but we have a problem as well. Um, one, one of my friends who was uh, uh, the representative in a country that I won't name to, a, to an Arab leader uh, had a conversation with the Arab leader and said, uh, sir, uh, we really think you ought to do more uh, lobbying in Washington because the American public and Congress and press are important. And this leader said, I don't need, I don't need that. Um, I personally know Bill Clinton. So he assumed that our system was like his system, uh, that he could make all the decisions. Uh, and in fact, to come back to Syria, the, I, I happen to know that the Syrian ambassador to Washington told his boss, the president of Syria, that President Obama could do anything because he was elected uh, by a large margin, and he could he could cancel uh, the boycott. Uh, there, there's I didn't mention this, but there's boycott legislation that prohibits us from doing business with Syria. The Syrian ambassador to Washington told President Bashar al-Assad, uh, if Obama wanted to do it, he could just cancel that boycott uh, with a wave of his hand, which isn't true. Uh, so the Syrian ambassador wasn't helping us explain to his boss how the American system works. An American ambassador, if he were there, would do that. Thanks. That's off the record, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the sake of injecting a little bit of a different opinion here, I think we'll, we'll, this, this will be, this will be good. good. Um, I had a situation in Belarus when I was ambassador uh, where the authoritarian president first closed down the Soros Foundation uh, for really no reason. Uh, then uh, threw out an American diplomat um, and then um, attempted to throw out another American diplomat on spurious grounds that this uh, young officer had been leading an opposition demonstration. and. Um, I went into the government, you know, to the Belarusian government and, you know, really protested this. Uh, and I recommended to Washington uh, that, that this was really getting into be a very, very disturbing cycle and that the only way that we would probably be able to get Lukashenko's attention uh, was to, you know, to sort of change the nature of the diplomatic discourse and I recommended that I be recalled uh, for consultations, which is not breaking relationships, but you know it's a step below. Uh, but it's still, you know, a very, very, you know, it, you know, it, it is still significant. Uh, and Washington did that, so I was, you know, I, w I was brought home, you know, for 
uh, one month. And when I got back to Washington to the State Department, some of my fellow uh, folk, you know, for, fellow former for, fellow Foreign Service officers who were in Washington said, "God, you'd go to any lengths to get out of that country for a month, wouldn't you?" <laughs> I say in that situation, I thought it was entirely appropriate, but in general, I could not agree more. We should have people in place. Actually, I have to say, not just because I'm here as a guest of Professor Yalowitz, I agree with what he just said. And if you bring the ambassador home for consultations and then send him back, that's fine. That may send a signal. The problem with Syria was the Bush administration withdrew Ambassador Scobie and didn't send her back and did not fill that position, sent her off to Cairo to another job, refused to fill that position. So their idea was, was not, we will send a signal and, and then send her right back. Their idea was, we're going to punish those Syrians by not having an ambassador there at all. That's what I object to. Uh, but I, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, in the back. Uh, my question is uh, related to uh, your listening up. Uh, uh, I, I've heard the news uh, uh, from MVPR. It's about uh, American de um, delegates were, was about to leave the uh, was about to leave the UN uh, con um, uh, uh, conference. Because uh, the, pre the the president president of uh, Iran was a, was about to make a speech, and uh, I did I don't know uh, I I didn't follow it up, so I don't know if American de delegates really left the the meeting. So my question is, uh, what is your personal um, t take on that um, on that uh, event happened in? Um, UN conference. Ah, you're, you're talking about the speech of Ahmadinejad at, at the United Nations? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting case. Um, I guess I have, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. You, you, you make a point um, if you walk out, um, and, and a, lot of peop a lot of other delegations walked out. And I suppose that's a useful uh, demonstration of your disapproval. I, you know, as a diplomat, I would rather sit there and listen to him and respond, you know? Um, that's my personal preference. I don't feel strongly about it. I can see the reasons for walking out, but I can see reasons for staying, you know? We ought to be willing to listen to outrageous criticism <laughs> and then respond to it. You know, I have to say, I don't know how many of you saw that speech, and I don't know how many of you by Ahmadinejad, and I don't know how many of you watched the interview by Charlie Rose of Ahmadinejad. I found a, an interesting contrast, because when he talked to Charlie Rose, he was very persuasive. Uh, and I frankly didn't think Charlie Rose did a, as strong a job as he should have as a public diplomacy person. Uh, in, in dealing with Ahmadinejad, who was well prepared. He had, he had very uh, telling and effective answers to Charlie Rose's questions. And Rose thought it would, you know, he, he would nail him by asking about uh, internal politics, and Ahmadinejad came back and talked about our internal politics. And you know, that was a very interesting lesson in public diplomacy, although you know, Charlie Rose is not an American official. But in the, in the UN, that was rhetoric. That wasn't a dialogue. That wasn't a, an exchange. That wasn't a discussion. Uh, that was rhetoric for, not for the American audience, really. That was for the Iranian audience, for the Middle Eastern audience, um, and for his bosses back home. He's not totally in charge. Uh, and he has to prove that he's, he's tougher than, than they are uh, in dealing with America. So to us, it sounds outrageous, and we walked out, and so on. But he wasn't speaking to the American public. Uh, he doesn't care uh, that much about the American public. Last question. <clears throat> yep, As an uh, American diplomat, how often do you find yourself engaging in regular diplomacy or public di diplomacy on the behalf of American business interests? Oh. 
Uh, it's part of your job as a diplomat and in public diplomacy <clears throat> to support American interests generally, and that includes American trade and commerce. Now, there's almost always an officer at the embassy, unless it's a very, very small embassy, whose job it is to represent American economic interests. There's either an economic officer or there's also a, a representative of the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, who, are, who spend all of their time, the uh, uh, Department of Commerce person spends all of his time working with American businessmen, working with local uh, business interests to try to promote American commerce. But it's also uh, important for the American ambassador and public diplomacy officials uh, to promote American business. As I recall, and, and Ken may correct me on this, uh, when I was um, still in the Foreign Service and Larry Eagleburger became Secretary of, of State, uh, and, and Eagleburger was, I think, the only career diplomat who, who ever became Secretary of State, Eagleburger sent us all a directive, uh, all, of, all of the ambassadors around the world, and all the embassies around the world, saying it is part of your mission and your job to promote American business. Now, I welcomed that. I'd already been doing that. <laughs> and I was glad he said I was doing the right thing. But I think most ambassadors before Eagleburger and since Eagleburger have regarded it as part of their job to promote American economic interests abroad, and that is American business. Now, if you have um, two competing American companies, you have to be careful not to favor one over the other. And if there is a, a competition for a contract, uh, you try to promote you know, both of them or all of them. Uh, but you, I spent a fair amount of time uh, talking to uh, government officials uh, about American companies. And you know, when, when they were trying, in Abu Dhabi, when they were trying to decide between an American tank and a French tank, I spent a lot of time talking to the UAE military uh, about the, the uh, advantages of the American tank over the French tank. So, you know, that's trade promotion. Thank you very, very much.